Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. And I want to encourage you not to worry about results. Just be faithful to the Lord. Plant the seeds of truth. Why? Then someone will come along and, and, and water them, and someone will come along, and there'll be a harvest if you're like, but I want to be in on the harvest. Well, I do too. Pray, Lord, lead me to someone ripe for harvest. By the way, he knows who they are and where they are. In today's broadcast, we begin a new two-part study from Pastor Sam entitled, An Example to Follow, Philip. Now we're in the eighth chapter of the book of Acts, and we will take up today in verse 26. We will be considering Philip's interaction with the Ethiopian eunuch, where he leads him to the Lord in response to the Lord's command to do so. So, let's listen in. Last time we focused on Saul and Simon. Today we're going to be considering a guy named Philip. Now, if you studied scripture for any time at all, you know that names and scripture can be a little confusing. In fact, when you read about Herod during the time of John the Baptist, that's a different guy than the Herod who was responsible for, well, in, in part, sending Jesus to his death. And so it's Herod, and then there's a Herod, and then there's a Herod. Well, the same thing happens with Philip. The word, the name appears 33 times in Scripture. It's three different guys, all in the New Testament. There's Philip, who was actually the brother of Herod. Philip was married to a gal named Herodias, and Herod kind of took a liking to her, and she left her husband Philip for um, Herod. And uh, John the Baptist, you might be familiar with this, got in his grill and just said, hey, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Repent. Well, that didn't go over too well in the palace. And both Herod and Herodias pretty much held a grudge. And ultimately, it leads to the beheading of John. So we know that it's not going to be that Philip. Now, there's another Philip. He is one of the 12 disciples or apostles. He's the one responsible for bringing Nathaniel to the Lord. And it's interesting because when he came and said, wait, we found the one who Moses and the prophets spoke of, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Well, the, the response of Nathaniel was, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip, and I love this response, he just said, come and see. That's a really good way to respond to somebody who's like, ah, I don't really know. I tried it or checked it out or I doubt it. And just come and check out the Lord. That, that's really what he was saying. Well, he's not going to be our guy. And, and the reason we know that is Acts 8, 1 said, After Stephen's death, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So we know Philip the Apostle stayed in Jerusalem. This Philip leaves. This Philip turns out to be one of the seven who were appointed to wait tables to take care of the widows so they could get an equal distribution of food. So we learn a lot of things about him, and that's why I've titled this study. It's a biographical study. We're just looking at the life of one guy and looking for the practical, well, what can we learn from him and what can we... Well, do to imitate him. He is a worthy example to follow. And so uh, we know he's one of the seven because he's the only other Philip that's mentioned in the New Testament. He, along with Stephen and the others, chose to take care of widows. And, and, and in the passage we considered, well, back when we looked at chapter 8, verses 4 through 8, and you might want to track back for a moment with me. It's all on the same page for me, so it's easy. But Acts 8, 4 says, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Now, Consider with me some of the things that we can learn from Philip and that we can imitate. And, and by the way, as I go through the scripture, it, it would be helpful for you to do something that I do. And, and one of the things I do is I not only look for and mark every reference to God and to sin and to the recipients, but I ask some very fundamental and basic questions. I ask of the passage, is there an example to follow? 
And oftentimes, there are great examples to follow. I ask, are there commands to obey? So if Jesus says to do this, and I realize he's not just talking to them, then I want to obey his command. Is there, well, are there any sins to avoid? Those pop up all through the scripture. Are, are there promises to, to uh, you know, receive or take hold of or cling to? And, 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 well, there are more questions, but those are just four of the ones I'm always asking. So as I looked at this passage, well, there are some sins to avoid and there are some promises to keep, but the example is just, well, fundamental because it's a biographical, uh, historical chapter, at least this portion of it. Well, we know of Stephen because he was chosen, excuse me, Philip, because he was chosen with Stephen and the others, that he was a man of good reputation. Remember that when they were chosen to find seven men, they said find seven men of good reputation. So this is the first of 10 things that we, we learn of him. These guys, and by the way, you guys, represent the Lord Jesus. And it, it, it's really about how people see him in us. Now, there's not anything we can do about how we lived prior to surrendering our lives to Jesus. The past is the past. And I'll tell you, everyone has skeletons in their closet, at least everyone who runs for public office, because as soon as they're, you know, out there, all of a sudden it's like 25 years ago, they said this weird thing when they were in their college dorm. And you're like, oh my gosh, well, keep me from public office, Lord, because I have a checkered past as many of you do. But I don't pretend that I don't. I simply declare that in Christ, I am a new creation. Old things pass away. All things became new. Now, I wish for Pam's sake they all became new immediately, but they didn't, you know. Some things changed over time, but, but God has been transforming me since day one, and he's been transforming you since day one. And this idea of being a good reputation or having a good reputation, it's very important. Why? We are his representatives. Someone has said, you might be the only Bible some people will ever read. I think that's true. They're watching you. They're listening to you. They're reading you. And they're trying to figure out, well, what's God all about? It's why it's so essential and so important that we become more like Jesus as we go out to represent Jesus. Well, the second thing we know of him, because it was said of all seven, is they had to be men full of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is an essential because, well, every born-again believer has a calling on his or her life. God has a specific plan and purpose to use your life in ways that you would have never thought and maybe even today would never imagine. And not only has he given you a special and personal calling, but he has given you all the spiritual gifts you need to fulfill the calling. It would be like in the natural world, if he called you to be a carpenter, he would give you all the tools you needed to be a carpenter. So as we go out to represent him, he, by the power of his Holy Spirit, has set us apart for specific ministries. He's gifted us, and then he empowers us. And this is so important. Our radio station this morning, and well, I, I got up much earlier than Pam, but she got up at 7, and, and uh, she wakes up to the, uh, the uh, Bible reading that's on our radio station, and, and I, I happened to be in the room at the time, and, and it was all about some of the judges, and, it, and well, Samson was the judge that came up in the story, and again and again, we're told that God's spirit came mightily upon him. God was able to use Samson, even though, well, he's a very questionable character if you go through and look at him. Not exactly a guy of good reputation, but he did have the Spirit of God upon him. And, and we need God to fill us with his Holy Spirit. I talked about it last time. It'll come up again and again as we go through here. Why? In order to fulfill our call, in order to use our gifts, we need to be empowered supernaturally by the Lord. Now, it's interesting. Paul actually uses the terminology or, or a picture of being under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He says, we're not to be drunk with wine and which is dissipation, but we're to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he gives us some idea what it looks like when someone's filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We've been doing that this morning. And, and then he goes on and, and he talks about, well, other things you can expect to see, the submission that will bring glory to the Lord. But, but all of this to say, 
If you think, well, if, if God wants to use me, I, I, I really, I, I need to have more power. Well, his power is available to you and, and, and he fills you, not just with the power of his spirit, but he, he gives you the fruit of his spirit. And in order to be good witnesses for him, well, I need to be more like him. Again, I need to be loving and merciful and forgiving, long-suffering, patient, kind. And, and, and although most of you probably assume, well, you're probably just like that. Ask Pam. Not really. None of those things come natural to me. Selflessness? No, selfishness. That's what comes natural to me. And so for me to represent him, I need to be full of his spirit overflowing his spirit. The third thing we know, not just of Philip, but of all those seven, is they were of good reputation, they were full of the Holy Spirit, and they were full of God's wisdom. Why is that important? Because man's wisdom is, well, it's the wisdom of man. In fact, the wisest guy on the planet that doesn't know the Lord is a fool in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible says the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. So someone can attain all sorts of degrees and they can have the regard and respect of their peers, but it's what God thinks of me that matters most. It's what God thinks of you that matters most. So we need to be full of his wisdom. By the way, the fear of the Lord, that is the beginning of wisdom. It is the starting point to recognize there is a God. I'm accountable to him. I'll stand someday in judgment before him. So we know these things are true of Philip, and, and he's an example for us. We need to have a good reputation. We need to be full of the Holy Spirit. We need to be full of God's wisdom. And then the fourth thing we learn is that, well, he was a real servant. They knew that he would serve and, and be faithful because they'd already seen that happening in his life. And it's an essential. If you don't know what God has in mind for you, find somewhere and serve him. Because people will recognize your gifts, doors will open that wouldn't have opened otherwise. We saw this with Stephen, we see it with Philip. Serving the Lord is, well, it just makes total sense if we're representing the one who said he didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. We also see that Philip was an evangelist. We read in Acts 8 verse 5 that he went down to Samaria and he preached Christ to them. Now, this whole thing of being an evangelist, let me clear up what can be confusing for some. We're not all evangelists, but we can all do the work of an evangelist. In fact, Paul tells a young pastor, Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. And what does an evangelist do? Well, he plants seeds, and he waters, and he harvests. By the way, the Bible says the one who plants is nothing. The one who, who uh, waters is nothing. And the harvest is the Lord. So I think even the guy harvesting needs to realize it's all about the Lord. And, and here's how this works. As I share the good news of the gospel with people, I am planting the seeds of truth in their heart. If I tell someone that Christ died for their sins, that he was buried and rose again, that, that he, he wants to forgive them and, and, and adopt them, he wants them to have a real relationship with him. As I share that message, I am planting the seeds of truth in their hearts. And I do that every week here. You realize that if you come regularly. I'm trying to model that for you once more. I'm trying to fulfill a call on my life. Do people come to the Lord in every service? No, they don't. But the truth is, that they can and how they can is preached and shared at every service. And I want to encourage you not to worry about results. Just be faithful to the Lord. Plant the seeds of truth. Why? Then someone will come along and, and, and water them and someone will come along and there'll be a harvest. If you're like, but I want to be in on the harvest. Well, I do too. Pray, Lord, lead me to someone ripe for harvest. By the way, he knows who they are and where they are. That can happen for you, but the work of an evangelist is to plant the seed. It's like, remember that story of Johnny Appleseed? I don't know if they're, that's in the school books. I think they mainly talk about people like Madonna now, but, but it's like, you know, in my day, people like Johnny Appleseed were in the school books, and he just kind of went planting apple seeds everywhere, and you know what happened? Apple trees everywhere, and apples everywhere. So the more we plant, the greater potential for the harvest. Well, Romans 10, 14 says this, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? When we declare the truth of Jesus. Well, I know it goes on to say, and how shall they preach unless they're sent? Jesus is sending us forth. Go and make disciples of all the nations. He's sending all of us. I think it was Abby's uh, little letter on her mission trip to uh Ethiopia, and I think she, she was, she's 16 years old, went to, to um, Africa on her own, met up with a group there, but, but her little newsletter said that, that God didn't ask us to be missionaries, he commanded us to be missionaries. We are his representatives in the world, and so he, this Philip, is an evangelist. How do we know? He preaches Jesus. And then he's supernaturally empowered by the Lord. Now, I already mentioned that he was full of the Holy Spirit. And you might say, isn't that the same thing? Well, yes, it is. But in his case, the possessed were being freed and the paralyzed and lame were being healed. And there was great joy. And, and so, again, if you've ever thought, well, if God would do that to me, then my relatives, my friends, my co-workers, my schoolmates, my workmates, they'd believe. God, just do something miraculous. Hey, he is. In fact... As you were transformed into a selfless person, from the selfish person, all of us are outside of Christ. As you're transformed into a merciful and gracious and forgiving and loving person, that's a miracle, you see. And you're like, yeah, but not like these miracles. No, it's a greater miracle. It's harder to change you than it is to change the outward circumstances of someone else. But it's a project God's up to and he's engaged in. He's begun a work. He promises to complete. And know this, Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in every born-again believer. So nothing is too hard for the Lord. Seventh thing we learn about him, and this actually bridges into verse 26, that was quick, um, is that he was submitted not only was he a servant, but he was a faithful, submitted, obedient servant. If you're wondering, well, what other kind of servant is there? The disobedient, unfaithful kind. And there are many of those in Scripture. Those are ones that were like, okay, that's a sin to avoid, to call yourself a servant of someone and then not obey them. And Jesus asked a very probing question. He says, why do you say, Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? He says, doesn't that seem inconsistent to you? We call him Lord. It implies a master-servant relationship. And then he gives us clear commands. And we're like, well, I don't think that's my calling. Or I don't think that's really my gift. Or I'm not sure that if he gives us a command, unless you absolutely can be sure he's not calling you to do it. Like he says, cross over the Jordan in the Old Testament. Well, I've actually taken that one literally and done it a couple times. But I'm pretty sure he wasn't saying to all of us, cross over the Jordan. But when he says, love your enemies, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you, do good to them, that's a command to all of us. So to be a submitted servant means, well, when he says it, if you love me, he says, keep my commandments. Well, Philip's in the middle of a major revival. People are coming to the Lord on the left and right. There's people getting healed and people are surrendering their lives to the Lord. And there's great joy in the city. And we read in verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Now we've mentioned that he's submitted, and we see it here. He's in the middle of this major move of God, and, and well, he gets word from a messenger of the Lord, an angel of the Lord, says, hey, Go on out here into the desert. Now, if you're anything like me, and I know some of you at least are, when you get that kind of instruction, you're like, are you sure? You know, how do I know that's really you, Lord? And I have a tendency, and I've always had a tendency, to question those things that don't make sense to me. I'm getting better. I really am. I'm starting just to obey the Lord, understanding, okay, student, students are allowed to question. In fact, you're supposed to be a Berean. Study and show yourself approved. Make sure these things are actually true. But 
as a soldier of Jesus and not just the student of his word. I need to put on the full armor of God and obey my master and commander. And a soldier's job is just to take orders and obey him. And so he calls us both. We're students, yes. And there's a time to ask and to probe and to search and to grow. There are other times because it's life and death. You know, in law enforcement, you have to follow the chain of command. In the army or any part of the military, you have to follow the chain of command. Why? Because it's a life and death situation. And so it is with us. This is a life and death situation. Because God has this Ethiopian eunuch out in the desert who's come to Jerusalem to worship and now he's returning and he is a man of great authority and influence. And God knows if he hears the gospel and responds to it, he's going to go back and share it and lots and lots and lots of people are going to be given their lives to the Lord. They're going to be sealed with the same Holy Spirit who sealed us. We're going to be in heaven someday rejoicing with them. So the deal is, questioning comes natural. In fact, I'm sure you've noticed this. If you have toddlers around, if you're raising toddlers, or maybe your grandparents, as I'm enjoying being, I've got a little three-year-old uh, Elijah, and he has one word that he almost uses for everything that, that you say to him. And that word, you know it, right? Why? Yeah, he just asked why. And I know that God has put this in a child, made them curious so that we can teach them. But sometimes we forget. So we can be, because I told you so, because I'm the grandpa or I'm the dad. Or No, here, here's what the Lord's been showing me, and it's really working. When he asks me why something, I say, well, because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and you know, darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God brooded over the darkness. And I just start sharing the word of God with them. I'm not kidding you. I'm doing this, and here's why. I know I'm planting the seeds of truth in his heart. The other reason is because half of the questions he asks, I just don't know the answer to. And, and, and so I figure I'll just tell him some scripture and at least plant some truth in his heart. We were watching Black Beauty, highly recommended, although I never watched it all the years my boys were older. But, you know, three-year-old, there's only so many movies. And, you know, Black Beauty, if you're unfamiliar, really beautiful horse. And he's got kind of a girlfriend horse. And, and uh, they get separated, and the girlfriend horse gets sick. And, and when I'm watching the movie with Eli, and, and, he, and he sees the, the horse laying down in this wagon. It's not a good sign. And, and he's like, why? You know, what happened? And I'm like, well... You see, Adam and Eve lived in this beautiful garden and, and, and then the serpent came and, and said, try this, and, and they did. And, because, and here's the cool thing. I'm actually telling them the truth. Why is that horse sick? Why is sickness in the world? Why is there death in the world? Why is there sorrow and suffering? We take them back to the, the place where sin entered in. Because you realize if there were no sin... You wouldn't have any sicknesses. You wouldn't have people that you love who've died. It, it, there would have been no death, no sorrow, no suffering. So, so all, all I'm saying is, why? That curiosity, it's a gift from God. And if you're a student, you need to ask why. But if you're a soldier, you need to obey your commander and chief. So often we tie the idea of being obedient to God and being holy together with avoiding sin and immoral acts and thoughts. Well, there certainly is no doubt that's where holiness and obedience begin. The Word of God clearly spells out how, as a child of God, we are supposed to live. Well, Pastor Sam also pointed out that as a student of the Word, we often will question God's directions for us when we don't completely understand them. But very often, we're not going to understand them, yet we are to obey anyhow. And this is yet another part of being holy in obedience. Well, listen to what Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, where he explains that as obedient children, we should not conform ourselves to our former lusts as we did in our ignorance, but instead, as he who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all of your conduct, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Now, one of our former lusts is the desire to know it all. And part of submitting yourself to Jesus is the willingness to say, compared to you, Lord, I am clueless. And I accept what you say wholly and completely. And I will do so even without an explanation that makes sense to me.
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.